So yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. As I was just saying, um, I've actually never been to Ukraine. I spent a lot of time in another part of the former Soviet Union. So Central Asia, in particular, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Um, and so for me, I've been in places which have experienced the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union. And um, I've studied armed conflicts, political violence, and political economies there. So how power and money affects the way that armed conflicts play out and the sides that are involved in those conflicts and, and things like this. So um, for me, I, I wanted to do some work which addressed and spoke to theology because I've studied theology um, over the last 20 years, but my, my own expertise is in international relations. and I'm a social scientist. So I'm very much coming to theology uh, from the social sciences, um, and I'm somewhat naive in that regard. In fact, at the moment, I am undertaking a second PhD in theology uh, at Trinity College, um, Bristol Baptist College here in the UK, because I want to improve my training in that area. So please be aware that I'm coming for, at this from a different discipline to yours. And so some of the things I say may be slightly naive or different, um, but they are from a different disciplinary perspective. What I was very keen to do in writing this book, Security After Christendom, was to broaden the debate about Christendom in the West, in the English speaking literature, from a focus on Western states and particularly Western Europe, to thinking about the experience of Eastern Christendom, and the colonial, former colonial regions that were affected by both Western and Eastern Christendom. And with Central Asia, I had some experience of that. But obviously, Central Asia is a majority Muslim region. Um, whereas in this book, I'm particularly interested in those countries that were Christianized um, through the, period, the experience of empire to some degree and how they have responded to that situation since. So a large part of the book looks at that and looks at that in a, in a global political context. So first of all, what do we what do we mean by Christendom? Um, so we might think Christendom is an age which has gone. It's a an age of the domination of the sort of Christian church in Western Europe, and that no longer appears to be the case. But actually, if we look more broadly, we see plenty of examples of ideas of Christendom being used and often being used in really dangerous ways which have effects on security. So I've shown you three pictures there of quite different figures. Um, first one is Anders Breivik, who in 2011 committed one of the worst terrorist attacks in recent Western European history in Oslo where he killed 77 people, mainly young people. And he did so in the name of a certain kind of right-wing Christian nationalism. In the 800,000 word manifesto that he wrote over many, many years to justify his terrible terrorist act, he used the word Christendom more than 100 times and the word Christian more than 2,000 times. And he called, called himself a member of the Knights Templar Europe obvious reference to medieval Christendom history. Donald Trump, a different figure in, in many respects, and I'm not using all these people here to, to make them equivalent to one another, just to show different examples of how they use uh, ideas, I think, which are related to Christendom. Donald Trump in his 2016 election campaign was very successful at courting US white evangelical voters. And he did so by promising to them that the state, that the US government could be used to advance Christian values, and not just Christian values in general, but a certain kind of Christian nationalist values, where the law and the institutes of government could be used to impose what was seen to be Christian values that needed to be defended. The most prominent way he did this was by agreeing to appoint conservative and typically Christian 
justices to the US Supreme Court. Um, but he also did it in other ways. For example, in 2017, he moved the US Embassy to Jerusalem, uh, which caused a huge amount of controversy and difficulty at the time. But he did so, it is widely understood, because he was trying to appeal to his Christian evangelical base who believed in a form of Christian Zionism where the dispensations of the end times in Revelation will be revealed through um, a final battle over Zion. And this may be one element in that, this focus, this bringing the conflict to, to Zion. Thirdly, I don't need to introduce you to, and I'm sorry even to show a picture of him here, of uh, Vladimir Putin, um, but whose essay on history from July 2021 has very clear statements about Christendom as his attempt to justify the terrible invasion and war on your country, which took place six or seven months later. Um, I imagine you are familiar with the kind of rhetoric, an imperial rhetoric that Putin uses and the relationship he has um, with uh, Patriarch Kirill, and I'm sure you're more um, familiar with that than I am, but there are a number of aspects that could be given attention to, not least the, the role of the Russian Orthodox Church in blessing and sanctifying the Russian nuclear arsenal through the use of uh, nuclear priests and a cathedral dedicated to the nuclear forces. Dmitry Adamski has uh, written about this with the title of a book called Russian Nuclear Orthodoxy. So all these for me are very troubling examples. Some are more troubling than others. Um, Donald Trump's version of Christian nationalism is one which has reasonably widespread support in the United States and can reasonably be debated. I think that's not true of the Russian worldview of Vladimir Putin or the Christendom view of Anders Breivik. But I think they are all using ideas of Christendom to justify their interventions and moves, which are, in the case of Breivik and Putin, uh, directly and physically violent. In the case of Donald Trump, one could argue they have violent and security implications. So this, in a way, is our subject matter. Christendom as a period of history, and when we think of it as a period of history, we tend to think about it as Latin Christendom, so the period of um, the sort of medieval, medieval era of, of the popes and the European monarchs in the Holy Roman Empire. That period may have died, indeed it has died, as a set of institutional relations. But the ideas about Christendom, the ideas that government and church should be closely related, that Christian values and ideas propagated in the church should uh, take a role in shaping government in various ways, uh, should that the government should take a role in advancing those interests uh, of the church and its security policy. I think those ideas are very much still alive and well. So what is this wider context in which they are today? Because that context from Latin Christendom has of course changed. Well, in the first way we could say it is post-imperial. So uh, if you look at the graph there that I've shown on the number of member states that illustrates this quite well. There are considered to be three waves of decolonization in the world, one which spans from the 19th century to the early 20th century, including parts of Latin America and other parts of Asia and, and the Middle East. And that led us to a situation in 1945 where there were 51 member states to the United Nations at its birth, which was already quite a number more states than had previously been acting politically in the world, so at the beginning of the 20th century. By 1965, the second wave of decolonization was, was very much underway, and we had widespread decolonization in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia, leading to 118 member states. And then by, um, by 2020, um, as of May 2020, there were 193. And a, a lot of those new additions um, were, of course, uh, post-Soviet states. 
because of the ending of the Soviet Union and also the ending of Yugoslavia and the breaking up of what in the West was called the Eastern Bloc in 1989 to 1991, a third wave of decolonization, if you like. But the reason it's post-imperial is that um, the imperial power dynamics which created colonies and states which were subordinate to other states, they remain in place in many respects, because if you look at the, the number of permanent members of the Security Council since 1945, that hasn't changed. And all five of those are former imperial powers who continue to have some aspects of imperialism in their relations with uh, their states, their, particularly their former colonies. And I would include China and the United States in this. China was certainly an empire and the US practically was an empire in the way it expanded across uh, the territorial landmass of what are now the lower 48 states of the United States, but also its relationships with uh, the Pacific region, with Central America and wider Latin America. They didn't involve well, in some cases, they involve formal colonies. Uh, most of the time, it was an informal set of imperial relations. So we're post-imperial in the sense that former colonies are now independent, but the legacy of empire lives on. Secondly, I think we can say we are living in a post-national age. So by that, I mean, the I'm thinking particularly here about political economy. So in Ukraine and the former Soviet states, um, 30 years ago, you had command economies where Gosplan uh, set the terms for a command and control economy. In the West, uh, we had nothing quite like that, but we did have state social democratic states where the national economy was commanded by government in a sense, and there were very strict capital controls uh, to prevent the movement of capital around the world, actually to enable free trade. So it was very much a liberal capitalist system, but it was one where the state had a very, very strong role as a gatekeeper to money, to finance. And that was the system that John Maynard Keynes, the British economist, had argued for in the Bretton Woods agreements around the end of World War II, and which led to the establishment of the World Bank and the IMF. Initially, their purpose was to limit the flows of money, to allow national economies to to fairly freely set their own terms of trade and uh, interest rates and these kinds of things. Today, these things have all begun to disappear, disappear. Obviously, the command economy of the Soviet space has ended. and I think that's a good thing in large part, uh, but also the ability of states to actually control their own economies has almost gone entirely because the free movement of capital means tremendous financial instability across the world. And we've seen that in a number of financial crises. Today, most economists would suggest that actually national economies are creations of statistics. They're not really things that can kind of be object objectively exist. We just create them by adding up numbers. But the reality is in terms of the movements of capital and the movements of people in labor migration, that the economy is entirely transnational and we're deeply connected to one another. So post-national is a second context. A third context is post-Western. Uh, so this is a related concept, I think, to the previous two, but, but slightly different. And we see this primarily, I think, in the shift of wealth from West to East. Uh, you can find on the internet lots of lovely charts which will show you the center of the world economically. And over the last 100 years or even 50 years, it's moved from the mid-Atlantic across Europe to somewhere now close to actually where Ukraine is, which I'm sure is very bitterly ironic for, for your country. But that midpoint indicates where the wealth of the world, how it's distributed and statistically where the centre lies. So what it tells us with these economic and financial statistics is that the growth of East Asia, particularly China, of course, but also other states in that region, has been one which shows that there's a shift of the balance of economic power towards Asia. I think it's also fair to say that what were previously dominant Western values, 
around liberty and well capitalism actually but a, a wider human rights agenda as well so a set of values some of which i think were informed by the christian church and christian experience others of which arose out of different ideas and contentions but many of those values, some of those values, particularly the ones around liberty and human rights, are being challenged somewhat, um, both within the West and beyond the West. So that's a third area, uh, post-Western. A fourth area is this idea of post-Christendom, which I'm engaging very directly in the book, and the secular age. And that comes from, I'm thinking particularly of the work of Charles Taylor, uh, although there are there are many other authors writing about this, um, it's important to say that a post-Christian world is not a post-Christian world. The Christian Church continues to grow, and even in those places where it's not growing, which is true in my case in the UK, it remains strong. Uh, and um, there are still close to half the population of Britain who would call themselves Christian. Uh, but it is certainly an age in which the influence of the church on public life in certain parts of the world, especially in Western Europe, uh, but I think that's more, that's also true in other parts of the world, not 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 universally, but certain parts of the world. Um, this influence of the church on the state, this set of relations of privileged relations that the church had, um, is in is in decline. So these are the sort of wider context in which we can think about this. So if in this wider context, how and why does Christendom matter? So I think we can we need to redefine Christendom to understand how it's being used by relatively benign actors, in, in, including some of those, I think, supporting Donald Trump, but also the more militant actors like Anders Breivik and Vladimir Putin. So in the book, I, I offer a new definition of Christendom as a, a theological political imaginary and uh, an imaginary of the partnership of church and government with the church legitimizing government and government securing the church. So it's important, this is a theological and political idea. Those two things go together. They cannot be um, separated from one another. They're completely intertwined with one another. A second point about this is that any idea of Christendom as a singular object is necessarily plural. There are always many different Christendoms through different eras, and they will take quite different forms. But I think we can say they have a family resemblance to one another. Um, I think I can certainly see family resemblances between Anders Breivik and Vladimir Putin, and possibly also extending to some of the ideas around the support for, for Donald Trump. Um, so in the sense that it's necessarily plural, we're looking at an idea and a set of imaginaries which began at least at the time of Constantine in the fourth century through Eastern Roman emperors like Justinian, through the Latin Middle Ages period and the Crusades, but also um, some more progressive movements across history who, which deployed ideas of Christendom in a sense of supporting minorities. So some theologians would claim that the civil rights movement in the 20th century United States was an example of Christendom. And more obvious examples of Christian Christendom would be some of the post-colonial nationalisms that we've seen in, in parts of the world that were once parts of empire. So, for example, in the African country of Zambia, uh, Frederick Chaluba spoke of the Lordship of Christ as guiding his presidency as president of Zambia. And that was quite a conservative view, maybe something uh, closer to conservative Christendom ideas. Whereas another uh, post-colonial Zambian president, uh, Kenneth Kaunda, spoke of Zambian Christian humanism, uh, which he had a more left or socialist agenda attached to that. So these ideas continue to live on. And then the important thing is that they are very, very plural. There's many different kinds of Christendom ideas, and we need to accept that plurality. Uh, the second, I think, as the final aspect, rather, the third and final aspect of this is that Christendom is always a subjective social reality. So being subjective doesn't mean it doesn't have an objective basis, but it means that all social realities are imagined and that means they may continue to be imagined 
after some of their institutions break down, after some of the objective conditions for them, like a very large Christian minority majority or a strong Christian church, they may weaken, but the ideas may survive. They do very often survive. It's also the case that Christendom can be unimagined, that a secularization takes hold, that Christians themselves and theologies arise which support the, the, this change in the relationship between church and government. So ideas of secularism in Christian theology, ideas of Christian, of, of post-Christendom rather, have arisen because uh, within the church there's been a conversation about the appropriate relationship between government uh, and the church. So this is Christendom, plural, subjective, theological, political. Uh, how does this then relate to security? Um, so security is also necessarily subjective. I've quoted here Arnold Wolfers, who is a Christian realist, actually, and I'll come to talk to them a little bit more in a moment. But Wolfers' definition of security is, in many ways, um, still the dominant one because it has these objective and subjective elements. So in his 1956 essay, he wrote that security is objectively the absence of threats to acquired values and subject, subjectively the absence of fear that sub, such values will be attacked. Now, that emphasis on values might seem strange when just today your own city is experiencing a rocket attack against physical infrastructure. But the conditions under which security matters arise are those where something is being valued to the extent that the actor is willing to defend it with the use of terrible, terrible force. So national security is a value. It doesn't just exist objectively. We have to imagine nation states. We have to lift them out. We build national cultures. We value them. And then we might choose to defend them through military means in violent and terribly destructive ways. So this is an attempt to capture that national security, human security, um, ideas of imperial security or international security are all value claims. And that's what Wolfers is trying to tell us about this necessarily subjective component. More modern ideas of security really take that point seriously and talk about the process by which something becomes valued as a matter of security. So the idea of securitization is a the dominant way of thinking about security in Europe. It comes from Barry Buzan, a British scholar and co colleagues in Denmark. They're called the Copenhagen School. I had the pleasure of working with Barry Buzan at the London School of Economics when I did my PhD and, and teaching this, 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 this topic for him as part of the course there. Buzan and colleagues define securitization as the process where a securitizing actor, so a particular actor who is seeking to make something a matter of security, whereby a securitizing actor identifies a threat to the survival of a referent object in order to convince an audience and take extraordinary measures. So there's a few elements there in that definition. The most important thing is that and our referent object of security can be almost anything. Certainly, I think almost any human community, and it can potentially be a non-human referent object too. It can be a local community, a business, a social movement, a nation state, a regional organization. It could even be a tribe or some other informal grouping. It could potentially be a population of animals or the ecosystem as a whole, secure those things to for the purpose of protecting it for us all. Uh, so other referent objects can then be included. So in all these definitions, there is always three elements that we need to consider if we're thinking about a view of security in this after Christendom age, <clears throat> excuse me. So the first of these is inclusion. Who is being, who's it for, who's security for? Who is being protected? Is it um, the poor or the rich, the national community or the local community? 
Is it a company or a public body? Uh, secondly, protection from what? So what is the supposed threat? It may be another community or it may be something entirely different. And then also there's this positive element of being secure for something. For what? So the provision of security. So it's all right uh, being free from warfare, but the security that one gets from the end of war has to also be about the building of the conditions of what's in the in the Hebrew Bible is called shalom. And so that is this element of security where occasionally the prophets in the Hebrew Bible twin peace and security together. Security is not mentioned in, in the Bible a great deal, but, but when it is, it's typically alongside peace. Um, so arising out of that, we can see there are challenges and other conceptions. The first of these is the security dilemma. So that is... Uh, where when multiple actors in the world each seek to secure themselves, they create a dilemma between themselves where it, where one makes themselves more secure that might threaten the other. And you get this tension arising where actions to secure oneself lead to a situation of insecurity arising. So the idea of the security dilemma says that a security actor has to interpret what the other actor is doing. And if they interpret it as a threat to themselves, they may take counter action. And that's the, the dilemma of response. So there's a dilemma of interpretation, is that threatening? And a dilemma of response, what should I do in response? What should I do in return to that uh, action against me? That leads to something called the security paradox, where in taking actions to make oneself secure, one's community exclusively secure against another community, then in those actions, one actually becomes less secure. So the very things that make uh, are supposed to make a community more secure, very often, in fact, make them less secure. So this is the problem of security, and it's a problem in which uh, Christians working in my field of international relations have engaged for uh, for many, many years. And in fact, um, the field of international relations, which is now about 100 years old, really is an established academic field, really began under the influence of these Christian scholars. And they were called Christian realists. This is a broadly Augustinian tradition, which is present in theology. Some of those who were involved in the early stages of forming the ideas of international relations were actually trained theologians, but more particularly history and the social sciences. It was Augustinian because there was this sense of what was possible in heaven is different to what uh, is possible on, on earth. And there are conditions on Earth which mean the achievement of security will always be fragile, temporal and um, always be a sort of temporary state before insecurity comes along. And that's also what makes this realist in these terms. So this is an Anglo-American tradition. Most of the scholars involved were British or American and they were writing in English. And that also included emigre European scholars, so typically um, Germans and some Swiss who had fled from Germany and the surrounding regions at the time of World War II. Wolfers, I think, was one of those, um, and there were a number of others. It was also what we could consider to be a mid-20th century moment in, um, in intellectual history. Um, and it was a mid-20th century moment because at this time we have this devastating World War II, we have the rise of nuclear weapons, and they're an extremely important part of the historical context, which is informing their thinking. But we also have a background of an interwar period where in both, where, where in both international relations and theology, liberal pacifist ideas were were predominant. They were the main ways of thinking about international relations. And both theologians and international relations people felt that if you could build up a rights-based system with laws and institutions, 
that these would be sufficient to reduce the level of violence in the world and prevent war. It's a very simple uh, summary. It was more complicated argument than that. But there's a certain amount of reaction to that liberalism and that pacifism in this Christian realist scholarship. So this was foundational to international relations, but this wasn't just a matter of building a new intellectual field. It was also about Cold War foreign policy, particularly by the United States. And many of these figures were influential. They were brought into US government to help develop ideas like containment of the Soviet Union, which developed in the uh, in the Cold War era and was part of US foreign policy. Key ideas for them were the balance of power. And here there was a specific biblical reference that was inspiring the notion of the Katakon from Second Thessalonians. Um, I'll talk a little bit more later about how that came into international relations. But the idea of a balance of power between forces in this kind of security dilemma between the United States and the Soviet Union, for example, but any moment of history, you would have a balance of powers. So the security dilemma would not get worse because the balance was, was stable. That was the idea. Yet, of course, Christian, realize, Christian realists always believed that the balance was temporary. It could break down. And so they were always expecting another war to, to break out. But their hope in all of this was an idea of Christian international society, that in certain periods of history, like Western Europe in the 17th to 18th centuries, which was the time they particularly identified Christian international society, you could get fairly enduring balances of power eventually emerge towards the end of that period, certainly after the Napoleonic Wars and into the 19th century. There might be periods where you'd have a relatively stable balance of power and war could be, war could be reduced. In fact, Christian international society was one of the most uh, warlike, uh, the one of the periods in history where there was the most war. So they understood that these things were temporary, yet... They, they also understood that attempts to build the balance of power were essential and were a part of international relations. That was the international relations that they expected to see and did find in their historical work. This is Christian realism was also related to just war theory in its Augustinian origins, but it was also in tension with it because ultimately realism believes that the idea of a set of laws or principles in international relations is always going to be very difficult, very provisional, and can potentially lead to misjudgment, miscalculation, and the security dilemma becoming worse. And most importantly, perhaps for them, there's a clear distinction between church and world, um, and that church and world were in dialectical relations. Church could occasionally hold the world to account, but the ability of church to speak to the world um was was limited the church needed to accept the security conditions allow the the allow government to advance uh values of the church domestically but not internationally so christendom for them was a value in terms of a set of cultural values within a state or a region but not as a set of international values in international security okay so I'm just going to go through three examples of this really quite briefly and then and then conclude, look at some criticisms and then talk a bit about um, method questions, actually. So I hope uh, if I have about 25 more minutes, is that OK? So, yeah. OK, good. So um, first example is is Hans Morgenthau. Um, so Hans Morgenthau was one of these emigres to the United States a German Jewish uh, legal scholar, actually, um, and became an influential advisor to the US government. The picture there you see is, is, is of him at a, at a US government meeting. So Morgenthau's political realism was based on the idea that universal moral principles cannot be applied to the actions of states, but must be filtered through the concrete circumstances themselves. So a very clear idea of political realism as being dominated by power blocks in security dilemma relations. Without recognize, if, if we fail to recognize the security dilemma, we fail to see what is possible in the world. 
His most significant book was Politics Among Nations, which came out as a first edition in 1948. I think it's been printed in about eight editions since then, and for many years was the primary textbook for students studying international relations. Now, obviously, Morgenthau was, was Jewish and a secular Jew, really, but he was certainly influenced by um, ideas of Christian thought and um, I was in a community of others who, who were Christian. I picked him out because he thought his ideas were, were predominant ones, although himself, he was not a, uh, a, a Christian. Uh, so the balance of power for Morgenthau was where you have policies to maintain a balance of power are not only inevitable, but are an essential stabilizing factor in a society of sovereign nations. So he saw a bipolar world emerging and he was trying to explain this, this bipolar world that he felt would emerge between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States, where there'd be a balance of power between these forces. Um, but he had a particular idea about the holder of the balance of power and the responsibilities that the holder of the balance of power had. So what Morgenthau felt was that if one state was particularly preponderant in power, it should not use that power too much. It should not exceed the limits of what is reasonably achievable. So he had a kind of sense of virtue here, the virtue of the holder of the balance of power. And he said that the holder of the balance must throw its weight at one time in this scale, at another time in the other scale, guided by only one consideration, the relative positions of the scales. So, on the one hand, this is merely a power consideration, but also for Morgenthau, there was a sense that the holders were typically those of particular virtue, of particular heritage and background. And he, he picked out the monarchs and nobility of Christendom as being the examples of how this balance of power emerged in, in Europe. So he's very much focused on the European experience. Um, second example, uh, Christian of Christian realism is an English scholar called Martin White. So White was one of these interwar pacifists and a conscientious objector, actually. So he refused to fight in, in World War I, who later became a realist. Uh, he was an historian and he formed something called, where well, he was part of something called the British Committee of International Relations. So well, the first body really to establish the disciplinary study of international relations in the UK. It actually came to be known as the English School because all members of it were English um, rather than Scottish, Welsh, Irish or whatever. White employed a strict division between his theological and political writing. Uh, he felt that, this is a famous quote from his, ruthlessly realistic analysis is not incompatible with hope for hope is a theological not a political virtue. So for him, there's two separate things going on there. The fact that his political writing was often very dark, often expected war to come, was one thing. But the second thing was that our hope comes from um, our theology and the community life of the church. So he had a very, very clear distinction between these two things. So, his key idea was that of Christian international society, which he saw emerging from the 16th to the 19th century. But he was very concerned by how this related, this balance of power that he saw emerging in Europe, how it related to the decline of Christendom. And that's a lot of his thought went into thinking about that. In fact, his essay, which I gave you to as a possible reading for this session, The Church, Russia and the West, in the Ecumenical Review, which was you know, he gave at the start of the, at the opening of the World Council of Churches, um, it was particularly concerned with trying to explain this problem. So how is the difficulty around establishing and maintaining a balance of power related to the decline of Christendom? Um, so he, he was particularly concerned with the intellectual and moral poverty, which he said was caused first by the intellectual prejudice imposed by the sovereign state and secondly the belief in progress so on the one hand you have the worry of sovereignty and a kind of state despotism that can emerge from that 
And the other hand, you have this liberal idea of a linear progress in history. And for him, neither of those were Christian positions and neither of those were the positions of Christendom. And so he was worried about how the decline of Christendom had made it more difficult to maintain a balance of power. Third and final example in theology itself is the Christian realism of Oliver O'Donovan. Now, that's the term I'm using to explain O'Donovan's work. Oliver has very graciously commented on the book manuscript or part of it in advance, and we exchanged emails about this. He very much works within theology, of course, a former professor of theology at Oxford. Um, I think you could say he's theologically conservative and politically liberal. And in that sense, he's quite similar to many of the other Christian realists. Um, he defends a kind of secularized Christendom, I think, which actually some people sort of would explain as post-Christendom. But in his book, The Desire of the Nations, um, he certainly uh, provides a defense of what the growth of Christendom did for the ability to generate order in the world and also domestically, although only domestically within countries, achieve certain rights liberties including of course the freedom of religion for different de denominations and professions of christianity something that he supports and as an anglican in britain i think he sees the established church as one example of that being done relatively well compared to other parts of the world so a defender of a kind of secularized christendom but also a realist and i'll quote this quote here for you from his work from uh, Desire of the Nations. He says, a political theology will seek to understand how and why God's rule confers authority upon political acts. It is not its goal to describe an ideal set of political institutions, for political institutions are anyway too fluid to assume an ideal form, since they are the work of providence in the changing affairs of, second, of successive generations. So this work of providence, obviously a classical Christian idea, one that Christian realists engage with, I think, critically, but their ideas of the balance of power and how it could be established by right authorities, often those authorities of Christendom, is an idea about providence and its work in history. So for, for O'Donovan, Christendom and also the idea of just war, he's also written a book on just war are examples of such providence at work in history. Um, but the church is different. So the church, for the church, security is guaranteed by the ascended Christ and needs no further underwriting. So there's a clear church world distinction here. So I think we get from all three of these Christian realists is that they actually engage very, very critically with um, the idea of uh, the Christian church having a privileged position in the state. Uh, they see that relationship in broadly Augustinian terms as dialectically related. And so they would have no, no sympathy, of course, at all to the very simplistic ideas of the imposition of a vulgar form of Christian history or values in the manner we see of an Anders Breivik or a Vladimir Putin, or, or even, I think, with the kind of use of the state to advance church agendas that we've seen with, with Donald Trump. Um, and all of those positions, I think, are reasonable, but there are certain criticisms that we must recognise when we look at Christian realism. So one, in, one criticism is about the influence of ideas from a Christendom era and, and Christendom ideas, heavy ideas on them. And um, one set of ideas in particular is the influence of Carl Schmitt, who was the um, early mid 20th century German jurist, uh, who was a member of the Nazi party in the 1930s for a period, uh, was, which if, if you remained a academic in Germany at this time, rather than being an emigre, like most of the uh, Christian realists were, you you would certainly have been required to be at least sympathetic to the Nazi party, and he was. Uh, Schmidt stayed in Germany partly because he believed in imperial geopolitics. And he seemed to believe that the Third Reich was a viable project, product, uh, project and that all geopolitics took place in that way with 
big power blocks arising and defending their values uh, of, of, of their own cultures and societies. Uh, so Schmidt's influence on Morgenthau, although Morgenthau was an emigre, he was Jewish, it seems counterintuitive that Schmidt would have an influence. But the idea of the catacomb as informing the balance of power was developed really in Schmidt's early 20th century writings. And Schmidt is thought to be a really quite significant influence on the emergence of realism. It's his ideas about geopolitics, about power blocks that are, are predominant. And more later, criticism of Christian realism, which John Milbank has made, is that it's methodologically atheist, that there isn't really a Christ in their Christian realism. Where is Christ there? Other than, you know, there is some sense of, uh, of sin, of the fall, um, of recognizing that. But where is Christ? Where is the redeeming power of Christ in their thought? And that, that charge could particularly be made even more so than against the Christian realist, against Carl, Carl Schmitt. Schmitt was not a Christian realist, but he was a Christendom thinker. And so that charge arguably could be made even more against him. I think there are further problems, though, with Christian realism. It is a helpful body of thought. It helps us understand things. Um, and it's been really influential. But there are further problems that we can consider. Um, first of all, it's highly statist. Now, in the mid 20th century, that might have made a lot of sense. Predominant states, nationalism was still universally strong and had took liberal and legitimate forms as well, I think, as the fascist type. Uh, but today, the state is being weakened in so many ways by the power of capital. Think about those contexts I spoke about earlier, the, the post-imperial, the post-colonial, uh, the post-national in particular, and the effect of the power of capital and the spread of supposedly universal values to undermine the state. So Christian realism was really focused on the state. For Christian realism, the object of security was always the state, so, or in the modern era was the state. In previous eras, it may have been taken a civilizational form, um, but typically it was the state as a container of power. It was also incredibly Eurocentric, and this is also very true of, of Schmidt and his understanding of geopolitics. Their cases were almost exclusively taken from Europe and, and the Western Bloc. They fought very little about the former colonial world as it was beginning to emerge at that time. And they were ideas of a certain period of history, very much focused on the European experience. And I think there was also a problem with how they understood providence, which led to them misconceiving the nature of violence and evil. So with providence, you tend to have a benign view of the victor in, in a given situation where you consider providence to be at work. So that political authority, which is holding the balance of power and doing so in a manner which allows war to be reduced or war to end, tends to be um, re um, represented as relatively benign. But the actuality, when you look at the detail of how balances of power are held, we see that they're incredibly violent processes. Um, and that the Cold War, for example, whilst it reduced or prevented nuclear war between the United States and the Soviet Union, led to an enormous amount of armed conflict, often at a very local scale, actually. We know of the, the major civil wars in which the powers engaged, whether it's Vietnam or Afghanistan. But there was far, far more state violence associated with the, the achievement of order. So this kind of realist thought about providence often understates the amount of violence involved in the establishment of any or, or any system of order. So these are some of the criticisms. I was asked to speak to questions of method and questions of possibilities and prospects. So in the final five to ten minutes when my hour is up, I will speak a little bit to those. So I wish to, in the book, critically engage with this Christian realism to recognize that it has something to tell us, uh, that it's an important intellectual history. Um, but it's, you know, and at, at the time it was extremely powerful analytical framework for understanding the world, but that we must attend to it critically and therefore we must uh, we must address questions of method. Um, the questions of method that I've particularly addressed, if we want to improve Christian realism, 
we, we require an approach which has at least six things to it. So at least this is the approach I, I try to take in, in this book. Firstly, we need to be interdisciplinary. Now, the Christian realists were theologically informed. Some of them were theologians. Um, and they worked on social science questions, real world questions in terms of reason and evidence in broadly social scientific terms. But they weren't interdisciplinary. Um, they weren't really engaging social science and theology with one another and exchanging them. And there's been a certain amount of skepticism uh, about whether and how that can be done. Uh, I mentioned John Milbank earlier in his, um, his book, Theology and Social Theory, uh, is from the late 1980s, I think it was originally written, is, has had a huge impact, I think, on the claim that um, it's very difficult to do this, that really all social scientific reasoning is methodologically atheist. There, and so it comes from a different starting point to that of theology. And theologians need to be very, very um, skeptical when approaching social science. Now, as a social scientist myself, uh, I suppose it is natural that I would consider that to be overstated. Uh, I think, you know, God gives us reason to understand the world. And I see in my world of social science, uh, people who are using that reason in ways which um, tell us things about the world that theologians sometimes don't see because of their own disciplinary starting point. So what I hope is that theology and social science can speak to each other. Uh, for me, as a social scientist, my worldview is informed primarily by, by theology, but my social scientific theory and reasoning doesn't in any way clash with that. It's not methodologically, well, it may be methodologically atheist in, in some respects, but it's not entirely inconsistent with a theologically informed worldview. So I think there's much more that can be done to, for those two to speak to each other. Uh, secondly, and following on from that, really, um, the Bible and evidence gathered by social science should, should really be brought together. Um, now, this can be very, very difficult. We often see examples of particular texts being used to explain real world events by preachers in churches, which are deeply, deeply problematic. But um, I see a great deal of wisdom between how biblical studies interpret say the growth of the early church or and how we see that represented in Paul's letters in terms of building Christian community or the problems associated with the Hebrew monarchs if you look at something like first Samuel chapter 8 and the uh, Samuel delivering the criticism to the people of Israel that a state would necessarily hoard resources and send the men off to battle uh, these are classical ideas of course but a great deal of wisdom about the nature of the state. So I think evidence, evidence from the Bible and evidence from the so-called real world out there do, don't necessarily need to be pitted in opposition to one another and can be intertwined. It's a very kind of basic point, but I think that doing that well is very, very difficult. Uh, people like Richard Balcom have written about the Bible and politics in ways which I think are really intelligent but also identify some of the real risks with applying scripture to political events. So we have to be careful, but I, I, think, I don't think that means we, we should not do it. And so I do engage scripture throughout this book, a book which is largely about um, the events of the secular world. Thirdly, we need to get beyond the state and we need to think in terms which are spatially attuned and multiscalar. So the kind of very territorial geopolitics of warring states and empires that Carl Schmitt developed in the late 19th well, for him in the early 20th century, and the Christian realists took on, I think blinders, they're like a tunnel vision. They blind us to the real nature of the world today. The nature of the world today is one where states remain powerful and they look dominant, but actually it is flows of capital, flows of people, networked relations between elites which are arguably the primary actors in most aspects of international relations. Um, and I will give an example here from the former Soviet world and which relates to your experience in Ukraine right now. Uh, the Russian state is taking actions through its armed forces, but we also know that the Russian state is created through kleptocratic means. The Russian state was extremely weak at the end of the 1990s. 
and the actions that Vladimir Putin took to build relationships with the oligarchs and make them subordinate to him was how he began to enrich the Russian state. But that didn't mean that that kleptocratic system was superseded by a Russian state, which looked like it did, say, in the Soviet era or the pre-Soviet era. The kleptocratic system became part of the state, as I'm sure many of you know very well. And so the movements of capital, the networks of elites, their personal enrichment, Putin's own wealth being extremely high, but the oligarchs and people around him having second citizenships, second citizenships very often, buying passports from a country like Cyprus, owning houses in a city like London. This is part of how power works and what it's for in the contemporary modern world. So we need to think about these kinds of transnational relations and states being decentered. They may do things which make them look like despotic governments, but they're also doing things to enrich their individual families and members who are part of those regimes. And Christian realism has no tools to understand that. And actually, most of international relations for really struggles with that problem. That's what we work on. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to try and speed up a little bit because I think these points are largely fairly basic. Uh, fourthly, it should be historical and, and historiographical. So I think there's a real need to look at the way that 20th century history was written, often focused on the state, and go back and explore this period of change towards just towards a secular age where actually the power of capital, companies, and networks of elites becomes more and more predominant and revisit that history. How, that's, how does that relate to the decline of Christendom? Fifthly, and again, this is what I'm doing in the book, much of this has been written about in great detail on specific aspects. So this kind of study like I'm doing has to be synthetic and in interpretative. It's based almost exclusively on secondary sources, for me, that's very, very unusual. I normally do primary resource, uh, primary source work. A lot of that's been ethnographic. I've spent three years doing research in Central Asia and Central Asian countries. But in this case, I'm using secondary sources and trying to get theology and international relations to speak to one another. And finally, I think we need to be aware of positionality. I'm very nervous about this book making global claims when I am just like the Christian realists, an English-speaking scholar in the Western world, I have spent a lot of time in uh, former Soviet Central Asia and some time in, uh, in West Africa, but I can't really speak for those regions. So I do think we need, when we, when we speak on, our, on these questions, need to be aware about what our background is and what we can speak to effectively and the need to grow the community of people speaking about these issues. Okay, so kind of drawing to a conclusion now. Um, I think we can move towards a theology of security and part three of the book that you have not seen tries to do that. And the radical claim here is that not what, what Martin White claimed as a Christian realist was that hope was a theological, not a political virtue. I think what we need to move to is hope being a theological and political virtue that by virtue of it being theological, it is also political because theology is necessarily political. Now, I think that does mean we need to engage with this question of what the appropriate role of the relationship between church and government is. And it's not of church occupying government in the manner that some Christian nationalists would say, nor is it, I think, um, being completely distant from and utterly detached from government in the manner of some kind of Lutheran two kingdoms approaches, which, which kind of break up this dialectic and say there's stable positions that church and government can take distant from one another. And I think that's a problem with some of this Christian realist thought. There should be a dialectical relationship. I think uh, Sigi Bulgakov, who I've been reading recently, his notions of Borgo Chilevichesvar and Chileveka. Or just for, um, I think is the terms he uses, are quite helpful in grasping this kind of relationship, broadly Augustinian and still realist in that sense, but really thinking about this close and intimate relationship where the church's role might be more like that of the Old Testament prophets, 
distant from to some extent having some role to speak but really retaining a distance from government speaking critically into government and to the extent that I have a role I used to be a civil servant actually in the British government in the Ministry of Defence but to the extent that I have a role today it's as an outsider saying some of those things that probably the British government doesn't want to hear quite frankly um, so I try and live that out in my own scholarship, but it's obviously an incredibly difficult position to take a certain amount of distance from the state that Christians must take. So the, in part three of the book, I sketch out some aspects of how this can take place. Um, I think it does need to engage with eschatology and apocalyptics. So I think it's necessary, therefore, to think about Romans 13, not just in its context, where a limited role for the state is given. If you look at the text preceding the first seven verses of Romans 13, at the end of Romans 12 and the latter part of Romans 13, uh, the role of the state is really an exception to, uh, to, 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 to social order, you know, where, which is built in the church for the people, for the Romans that Paul uh, and his co-authors are writing to. But that must also be compared to the image of the state we see of the two beasts of Revelations 13. And so I've done some writing on that. And then just getting back to these questions of security, inclusion, protection and provision. I, I can't elaborate these arguments here, but for me, inclusion is a question of hospitality and otherness. Forms of security which exclude, which seek to build security for those within a community against another community will always lead to more conflict and war. The security dilemma tells us that. We know that's true. So any real effective approach to security needs to be one of recognizing otherness, offering hospitality, opening borders to flows of forced migrants. And that's a struggle to maintain those theologies and develop theologies of otherness and maintain practices of hospitality. I don't think the role, of, the role of the church is to take a role in government and make government do that. The role of the church is to do that itself. And there are many, many, many Christian organizations and churches, many of which you'll be involved in. I'm involved in some that, that do just that. Thirdly, nonviolent protection. Um, so there's a, one thing that one chapter of the book does is looks at, looks at the power of nonviolent social movements, even in armed conflict situations. So very often movements which, which were informed by Christian theology or which grew out of the church that are involved in something called unarmed civilian protection, accompaniment typically with people in armed conflict situations. Persons of privilege entering persons of and uh, ent entering into places of warfare and that being a transnational solidarity that can be done, I think, particularly within the church. Um, fourthly, the notion of abundant provision. So what the economy today achieves is scarcity and competition over scarcity. Uh, but this, what the church aspires to and idealizes is an abundant provision, practical sharing against such scarcity. And I try and develop that argument in light of the debate over climate change and the, the transition towards that. So this is a, a, a theology of security where the principal actor is not the state. It is the church. The, the state is a secondary actor. And certainly the role of the church is not to buttress or sustain or help and assist the state in a set of secular responsibilities as the Christian realists saw it. OK, so just a final note on prospects and then I will finish because my hour is up, I think. Um, but I think it's really important that this occurs ecumenically. I've put pictures there of four individuals that I think can really contribute to this debate. Uh, one is Orthodox in Sergei Bulgakov. We also have the Mennonite John Howard Yoda. Uh, the quite radical theologian from a Lutheran background, Dorothe Solier, a German and René Girard, a uh, French, not a theologian actually, but social theorist and theorist of literature. I think there are certain parallels in their writing. They're both, they're all engaging in apocalyptics and they all speak to these questions of the theology of security. And so for the doctoral project I'm doing, it's to explore these authors. I'm not sure exactly which three yet, but three of those I hope. Secondly, and I touched on this already, it needs to involve a global dialogue. 
between the north and south and east and west of 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 the world i think if it becomes a debate which is dominated by highly privileged western scholars writing in english it will not be an effective debate i will just leave that at that um, the dialectical possibilities are really important and um Again, this is a theoretical argument developed in part two of the book. I can't really fully elaborate it here. But I believe this tension between the building of new centers of power in the secular state and the decentering which comes from when the church takes a prophetic stance is really, really important. Equally, that tension between um, an enchanted world that of Christendom and the disenchantment of secularism allows us to get to a place where proper relationships, which go back and forth between a certain amount of closeness with the church speaking into the state, but then always followed by distance where the church steps back from the state. That tension between enchantment of politics and disenchantment is really, really important. So the dialectic is, is a key, I think, for, think, for, for, for thinking about this. And then finally, uh, some kind of recognition that apocalyptic times are not just simply that moment at the end of the world, but they are times that we live in, partly because of these dialectical tensions, these tendencies towards deep centralization of power or states trying to sacralize themselves. There's a great deal we can see in the world through the vision of Revelation 13. That doesn't mean that we move to a particular kind of eschatology with dispensations or predicting of when the world will end. But it means that we should recognize that the beasts of Revelation 13 are something that appear recurrently in the world. They were there in Rome, in Babylon. They are there. They were there in the Soviet Union, in the Nazi regime. Perhaps they are there also in Vladimir Putin's Russia today. And these things are anti-Christic. They are apostasies of the Christian gospel. And therefore, we must look for new emergent models to challenge them, to argue against them, and to think about the proper role of the proper, a proper theology of security. But this really is just the beginnings of some thoughts on this. And I've already spoken for an hour, so I must not stop now. And thank you for your time.